It's Sunday morning, and we're talking about uh, how the world has corrupted truth, how they don't believe in the narrow way. Narrow is the word thalibo in the Greek, T-H-L-I-B-O. That's the word narrow. Narrow is the way that leads to life, and only a few will find this narrow way. The word narrow is the same basic word as tribulation. Paul said we must through much tribulation or through the narrow way enter the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God was an old ancient term for Israel and we are spiritual Israel of the church. I was in a, I was in a doctor's office the other day. I got to tell you this. Now, I wear these shirts all the time. My favorite shirts, I got about three of them that say God does not love everybody. Well, I was in my doctor's office and uh, in my allergist office, and this old lady somewhere in her late 70s, probably somewhere about my age, no, old lady. That's not the shirt. Huh? No. Oh, no, no, that isn't the shirt. I got, I've got, God doesn't love everybody, but I had on a new shirt I had made up. It said, most people are going to hell when they die. <laughs> and the back of it said, very few people are going to heaven. And this woman looked and she said, she's old like me. And she said, most people are going to hell when they die. I said, I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Jesus said, straight is the, straight is the gate and now is the way that leads to life. And only a few there be that find it. She said, why didn't you put that on there instead of that? <laughs> well, it's the same thing. <laughs> because wide is the gate and brought us the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in there. Most people are going to hell when they die. Only a few are going to heaven. And that's a fact if the Bible is true. The whole world is insane. You tell people the truth, say this comes out of the Bible, and they're nuts. They are actually insane. I believe America's insane. You know that frustrated me when I was in the music world? I didn't understand that. It frustrated me when I was in the, when I was in the uh, uh, real estate business that people were insane. They cannot understand the truth. They won't even accept it when the Bible says it. Whenever I say I didn't say that. Jesus said that. They go, well, you could put something else on there. The world is nuts. When I say insane, here's what I mean. This comes out of Webster's Dictionary. I had a guy write to me. So I looked up the word insane. It doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't mean irrational. Well, if you look up insane, it will say, see, derange. And then what you got to do is look up derange. When you look up deranged, it'll say mental illness. Mental illness. And then you keep looking these things up, and it'll say mental illness, and then it'll say to upset the arrangement of order or disorder. And all of a sudden, my mind goes to 2 Thessalonians 3 and 6. Where the Bible says, if anyone walks disorderly, you're not having anything to do with them. And then I look up disorder, and it says, senseless or impractical, unsoundness of mind. And then unsoundness, we get the word sound, and the Bible speaks of sound doctrine. If anyone comes preaching any other doctrine, it's not sound. We're not to bid them God's speed. The word sound is the word H-U-G-I-A-I-N-O. It means uncorrupt. And then I look up the word sound. I don't look up one word. I look up all the words that are related. So if you're going to look up a word in your dictionary, everyone needs, as well as a concordance, you need a Webster's Dictionary. Get the Intercollegiate Dictionary because when you open it up, It'll tell you not only the meaning of the word, it'll tell you where that word comes from. When you look up the word agony, agony, they'll tell you it comes from the word A-G-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I. They may change the wording to ending to 
agonizes thai, which is a form of the same word, word, and we speak of striving to enter in at the straight gate, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I said, you will seek to enter in the straight gate, and they'll not be able. That's because they're trying to enter in to the wrong way. You can't enter into a nice, comfortable gospel. That's not... The Bible says that people are going to hate us when we tell the truth. Strive is the word agonizomai, A-G-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I. Well, that comes, and it'll even tell you in the Webster's Dictionary, this comes from the word agon. And it will say contest. Not only will it say it in your concordance, but it will say contest in the Webster's Dictionary. It comes from that. And here's the agon right here. If I can find my deal here. Here's the agon. All right. Here it is right here. The agon was the arena where they took the Christians in and turned the lions and the wild animals and bears against the Christians. And sometimes they would put them into the agon to fight the gladiators. And they'd fight them all day during the day. And then when the Caesar would get tired of it, he'd say, okay, uh, just turn the animals in. Don't give the Christians a chance. Sometimes they'd give Christians a sword to fight a lion, and they're not fighters. Or they'd give them a sword to fight a trained gladiator killer, as if they could come out of it. After the end of the day, they would take the swords away from the Christians Say, okay, turn the lions in, turn the gladiators in, and let them hack them to pieces. Paul said, we were in the theatron, in the agon, in the contest, and we were last in the contest. We had no chance. God turned us loose against the beast of this world, and they slaughtered us. So, when you look at a Webster Dictionary, they'll tell you the truth about agon, agonizomai. But you try to tell somebody that we have to agonize over the truth, and they don't like that, do they? Hey, we got the real one right here, the real picture. Yeah, there's a real... In fact, Mike brought that picture of the agon back. It's over here. Oh, the one that's painted, that's a picture of the real agon on the right. Mike brought that back from overseas. This is that uh, retired Marine that worked with uh, Israel... Yeah, the flood, they would flood that and have all kinds of battles. Now, let me go through the rest of this. Then it says, unsoundness of mind, great folly, lunacy. You look up lunacy and it will say psychosis, mental disorder, uh, unsettled disorder, crazy, unsound, eccentric, unbalanced, irrational. Irrational means not rational does america think rational no they're absolutely irrational the preachers are irrational we're irrational about our own history memorial day is tomorrow 2018 we don't know nothing about america we're irrational about america there's some books if you want to read some books that are enlightening go to barnes and noble Order some of the books by Richard Schenkman. He was a graduate of Harvard, had a doctorate in history, brilliant man, used to research for the Library of Congress. He's got several books. He used to have a TV show where he would re reveal truth about what was going on. Now, every time I meet a historian, in fact, we've got a historian, well, I'll say historian, got a degree in history. That's Dan Wilson. Is Dan here? Back there, Dan has got a degree in history. He said, Jim, I've heard a lot of the things that you've talked about, about the truth of American history. He said, I haven't heard it at all. When you read Schenkman, he's got this book called Presidential Ambition. He nails the presidents. Did you know that we had a homosexual president in the White House in the 1800s, James Buchanan, and his boyfriend, girlfriend, lived in the White House with him. He was a guy. He was the wife. And they used to call his boyfriend Miss Fancy, the people in Congress did. We didn't even know we had that, did we? Miss Fancy. 
<laughs> it's fancy. I think that's funny because I don't think homosexuality is any worse than being an adulterer. People have said to me, yeah, but they put people to death to homosexual in the Old Testament. I said, well, they put, death to de they put adulterers to death too. How many people say, do you believe in capital punishment? Not anymore, I don't. You have to absolutely know that somebody is guilty, and they don't even know that about... There's 13% of people that are in prison that they've discovered so far that are not guilty of what they were accused of, so especially since we come up with DNA testing. They found out a whole lot of them, a lot of those prosecutors want to get somebody guilty, and they don't care how they do it. And then Richard Schinkman's got a book here called Cherished Lies and Myths of American History. We don't think rationally. If we did, we'd buy these books and read these. And he's got one called, I Love Paul Revere, Whether He Wrote or Not. This is about historical things that didn't happen the way we were told. Matthew Henry did not say, uh, give me liberty or Matthew Henry. I got the wrong one. Patrick Henry. <laughs> Patrick Henry did not say, give me liberty or give me death. Matthew, well, Matthew Henry didn't say everything right either. But Patrick Henry did not say, give me liberty or give me death. That was one of his publishers. His publicist put it in a uh, a printing and uh, Nathan Hale did not say I regret that I have but one life to give for my country all kinds of things were not true about our founding fathers <coughs> Thomas Jefferson was not a Christian self-avowed was not neither was Ben Franklin and neither was George Washington gosh you know how much I've taught on this I can't even get to these guys George Washington was a thief and a liar Gosh, you don't like that on, on Memorial Day weekend? They had something, gosh, i got to get into another book. They had something called The Doctrine of Discovery, and you can get that at the, at the uh, Barnes & Noble. Doctrine of Discovery was about when Columbus came to America, Columbus was not, a, was not a, an Italian. He was a Spanish pirate. He was given the what was called this edict by the Pope at this time when he came to America in 1492. Columbus came to America under the edict that was given to him by the Spanish king and queen of Spain. That was Ferdinand and Isabella. And at that time, the Pope, Pope Alexander VI, was a Spanish Pope. In fact, he was one of the Borgias. Is anybody familiar with the Borgias? He was a Borgia. The Borgias were murderers, and Lucretia Borgia was his daughter, and she was considered one of the most infamous murderers in history. And he was killing people. And he gave this edict of the Doctrine of Discovery to... Ferdinand and Isabella and told them to give this to Columbus so that when he comes to America, this new land, he can take all, any land he wants to and that the natives of this land, the aborigines of this land in America, aborigines, the original inhabitants, the American Indian didn't have any rights, they didn't have any souls, so you can take the land and if they won't give it up, since they're not even living human beings, you can kill all of them you want to. Well, in that Doctrine of Discovery, that went through a process, and later on, several hundred years later, that was applied by Jefferson and by Washington, and Washington used that Doctrine of Discovery to annex 10,000 acres of American Indian land to himself. No pay, no money, he just annexed it to him, and he became the richest man in America. You can get all this out of Mr. Shankman's books. And there's a man named James B. Lowen, and he was a historian also. Talk to a history, a history major. They'll tell you the truth about it. I went into American history class in Texas A&M in 1957 in the fall. Walked into the class, sat down in the chair, sat down at my desk, and the first thing the American history professor said was, I cannot tell you the truth about American history in 1957. They won't allow it. I'll just give you answers. You give them back to me on tests. America is deranged, even about our history. 
It's crazy. If you read these guys, he'll tell you all about these presidents and the lives. The most interesting, one of the most interesting stories, all the presidents wanted to have a legacy. They wanted to be legendary and go down in history for having increased the land. So this doctrine of discovery was picked up by George Washington. That's why he stole 10,000 acres. Of, he was a thief. He stole from the American Indian. And Jefferson got behind this. That's why Jefferson sent the Lewis and Clark expedition up to the northwest, up to Oregon and Washington. Anywhere in this, in this decree, anywhere you would put a stake, if you were, a, you had to be a European, Caucasian, Roman Catholic conqueror for this to apply to. I'm not a Roman Catholic. It was a Caucasian decree that you had to be a European Caucasian in order to come and execute this doctrine of discovery. That's why Andrew Jackson, our Tennessee president, drove 150,000 native Cherokees from Georgia on the Trail of Tears, and we have that in Nashville. It runs right down, right down the old Hickory Boulevard. You're familiar with that, aren't you? And he drove 150,000 to Oklahoma, and 4,500 American Indians died in that, that executive order. Then James Monroe got a hold of it, and he started something called, he just simply changed the name of Doctrine of Discovery to Manifest Destiny. Go west, take over what you can, and if they don't like it, throw them out and kill them. And that's why Lewis and Clark went on that expedition. In that doctrine of discovery, all you had to do was drive a stake into the ground on a river, and everywhere that river went, you could claim that as your land. And it's still in the forest. Huh? It's still in the forest. It's still, at, believe, by the way, like Mary said, yeah. that doctrine has never been taken off the books. It's still in effect. So that's why America was founded on racism. Did you know that? Not racism against the blacks, racism against the Indians. That's why it was easy to take the blacks' slavery. And Jefferson said he didn't believe in slavery, but he couldn't run his nail factories without them. <laughs> now, that's a real good Christian, isn't it? Jefferson was a heathen, and so was Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin said he believed in the divinity of Christ, believed there were other gods as well. Well, you can't believe in the divinity of Christ, and he's being God, and you believe in these other gods. If you start reading one of these books, you can't hardly put it down. One of the biggest things when it came to when it came to this manifest destiny, our famous Tennessee president in the 1840s, James Knox Polk, Polk <laughs> Avenue, anything named the Polk Building that they tore down, was named after him. He wanted to. They all wanted to go down in history with a great legacy, be a legend. So James Knox Polk said, I want to annex Texas, New Mexico, California, and some of Colorado. I'm trying to tell you how we don't even know our own history, much less, much less the truth about the Bible. We won't even face our own history. We have a retired colonel that comes here and Mike can't come all the time he's very sick has a lot of problems Mike told me one day he said whoever wins the war gets to write the history and that's the truth they wrote our the historians were in favor of America you can't believe uh, Mr. Shankman said the only reason George Washington became the first president, became the head of our Revolutionary Army, is he showed up in a general's uniform. So he said, well, he's not a uniform, let's make him, because it was a brand new baby nation, and they didn't know what to do. It was all, it was, they were all clumsy. He wasn't even that good in battle, Mr. Shankman says. It's amazing. James Knox Polk said, I want to annex, annex Texas, New Mexico, California, and part of Colorado. So what he did, he said, we will invade Mexico. <laughs> and they did. But Mexico then was what we call T 
Texas. So he put some armies down there for about 18 months. He invaded Mexico with armies trying to provoke the Mexicans to war. And it was hard to provoke them to war because we were a super nation compared to them. And we could beat their ears off. So when he finally provoked Mexico to attacking his troops, we went in there and slaughtered them. There's no wonder that Santa Ana at the Alamo came in and slaughtered everybody there. He was a barbarian, and he was a, he was a butcher. But we didn't give him any reason to back off on anything. He said, kill them all to the last man. And so Mr. Mr. Polk, our president at that time, said we will push them until we just slaughtered the Mexican army. And then we came up with this idea of a treaty, the Hidalgo Treaty. Hidalgo Treaty was a joke. When you have a treaty, that's when two armies are fighting. You say, let's stop and have a treaty talk. A treaty is so that everybody can come to a compromise in their war. That's what a treaty is. Instead of that, we beat their ears and said, now we got this treaty and we're going to demand that you abide by it. So Mr. Pope annexed Texas, New Mexico, California, and part of Colorado. We don't know that, do we? Our historians will tell us that. You want to know? They'll tell you. Historians know. I was down at Dillard's uh, down here at Rivergate Shopping Center. Dillard's is a big department store. I was in there looking at some shirts about six or eight years ago. And this old guy in his late 50s, something like that, old, looked to me old, anyway. And uh, in his late 50s, maybe early 60s, I said, what would you do before you were selling down here? He said, I used to be a high school history teacher. I went, whoa, this is my chance. I said, then you know the truth about Jefferson, Ben Franklin, and George Washington and the boys. He said, well, yeah, but you know, he was going to make excuse for them. Everybody has their opinions, the way they look at things, and no, they were heathens. How did they end up being the legend that they are? They ended up being the legend because our teachers and our politicians sold America on their image so they could get elected. It was about money and power today. It's like Mr. Shankman said, one-third of the Revolutionary Army deserted. They weren't patriotic. He said, patriotic was when you picked up a gun and went to fire and shoot. In this book, I love Paul Revere, whether they know it, wrote or not, he says, the American flag never flew over any public installations till the Mexican-American Wars in the 1840s. Old glory did not... Francis Scott Key, who wrote The Star-Spangled Banner, he will tell you, he thought that the War of 1812, he said it was a lump of wickedness and I hope America loses. He didn't write it as a patriotic song for America. We didn't have a, a national anthem until 1931. That was eight years before I was born. <laughs> that's, when they, that's when they made the Star-Spangled Banner, the National Anthem. The, this information goes on and on. All I'm doing is showing you we don't know the truth about our history, much less the preachers knowing the truth about the Bible. They don't know nothing. Nobody defines anything. If you go to the bookstore and ask for Richard Schenk, but a lot of these books will be, you'll have to order them special order. This is the first one he put out that was, a, this was on the bestsellers list. Cherished lies and cherished myths of American history. They'll tell you the truth. That's why America's insane about the Bible, about everything else. Insane. What it is, they were possessed with devils and they still are. The word demon is the word D-A-I-M-O-N. I O N. That's our word demon. Demon. And it means, it comes from dio, meaning to distribute fortunes. 
that's what's wrong. Who do you distribute fortunes to? Huh? To the to the individual. When you look up, when you take your Webster's Dictionary that I showed you a while ago, and you look up capitalism, it has the basic same meaning as demon. It, it will say, distribute the fortunes of industry, like railroads and so forth, to the individual. Capitalism has the same basic meaning as demons. In fact, Thomas Jefferson, actually, he, you can look up, gosh, I, I got a million places to go. You can look up, you can look up U-D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. You look up eudaemonism in the Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion, it will tell you it means well fair. It means well demons. A good distributing fortunes are the welfare of the people. If I'm making this up, I am really good, ain't I? Now I can remember it because I've read a thousand things on it. There's nothing Christian about America. We've got so much money. Isn't the love of money the rule of all evil? There in the sixth chapter of First Timothy, in that the, the love of money is the root of all evil. Love of money is one word in the Greek, P-H-I-L-A-R-G-U-R-I-A. -I -I Philogoria is a construction of philos and argory. Philos means an affection. It comes from the word phileo, which is our the one word that's been translated love. You get two words been translated love. You have the word agape and the word phileo. And phileo. Phileo means affection or to like something. Agape means to walk in the commandments of God. This is agape, this is love, that we walk after God's commandments. Well, philogoria, love of money, means an affection for argory, argoria, and argoria means to shine or silver. The only reason men want silver is so they can shine above everybody else. That's why you want a lot of money, isn't that it? Isn't that why you want new cars and new houses and new stuff and the diamond ring? and So you can shine. Hey, look, did you see what I got? I'll tell you what you do. You don't know these Greek words that I'm teaching. Go around telling the people, they're not going to like you and your ring ain't going to impress them. You can drive a brand new Mercedes and they're not going to say, boy, I really like your car. They're not going to say, I hate you, Jim Brown, but I like your car. They're going to hate you for telling them Christmas is pagan, predestination is true, and God doesn't love everybody. They're going to hate you for that. So it don't matter how you dress. I walk around town with cutoffs on in the summertime, and I always have a shirt on that says God doesn't love everybody. Predestination is true. If you don't believe that, you're Antichrist. You start telling people the truth, nobody's going to care how you dress or where you live. Where do you live now? Now that you've made me feel bad about all these things about truth. America's insane. Remember demon. You remember the word demonion is the word demon. And D A I M O N I Z O M A I. Demonizomai is a word that means possessed with devils. When it's said that the man is possessed with devils, it's one word in the Greek, this is it. When you go into your McClinic and Strong, look up the P volume, possessed with devils. They will tell you that means to be insane. The man in Luke 8, 
in Luke 8, the man of the Gadarenes, he was possessed with devils. But if you look at Luke 8 only, you're not going to get the whole picture. You've got to go back to Mark 5. That's Mark's account of the same man. In Mark, the fifth chapter, the guy is crazy. He's running through the tombs, cutting himself and screaming. You think you can talk to a man like that and he's going to tell you some truth? When Jesus said, what is your name? He didn't say, what is your name? That's not what he said. There's another mistranslation of the Bible. It's, how do you know what it says? Well, you can just get your, I got an interlinear Bible up here somewhere. I saw what's over here. You can get you an interlinear Bible and you learn the Greek alphabet and you can find out exactly what these words are. Here's an interlinear Bible. The New Testament is written in Greek. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament Greek, you can go over here, learn your alphabet. I'll teach you the alphabet real, real easy, real quick. A, B, G, D. Don't worry about the caps. They're very seldom ever used. A, B, G, D. Instead of a C, you, you, G is like a little short stubby Y. A, B, G, D. A D looks like you're going to make a D, but you just curl it on top. A, B, G, D is how it starts. And then remember E, Z, E. Do you remember E, Z? The Epsilon, the Zeta, and the Eta. This is a Z. Why are they putting the Z here instead of at the end of it? Well, they were here first, okay? <laughs> and they can do how they want to. So E, Z, and then a TH, a Theta. T, H, L, I, B, O is the word narrow. That's one letter in the Greek. It's actually like this, T-H-L-I-B-O. Or either, you've got two O's, an Omicron and an Omega. This one is pronounced O, this one is pronounced Ah. Then you have T-H, and then from here, you already know down to here. It's just our alphabet minus a Q. I, no J, no Q, no J, no Q. I, K, L, L looks like an upside down Y, M, N, M looks like an upside down H with a little hook on it, N, then this is an X here. This is not an X. This is a key, C-H, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-S, Christos, Christ. And then this is an X. This is a Kazi, K-S-E-E. -E. Kazi is the way it's pronounced. In fact, you would have X-E-N-O-S. I should put it this way. Kazi, I'll get it here. Kazi, E-N-O-S. That would be spelled. This is an X. Thinking not strange concerning the fire which trial which is to try you. That's the way it's spelled in the Greek. So you got I K L M N X O P looks like a pi and it is, but it's a P. No Q R. Just knock off the front leg off the R R and you got the Greek R S. S is in the middle of the word like this. On the end of the word it's like R S, like that. T U and then a P P H P H I L E O. I just went through that. And then a key. And then Pazi, remember that Pazi, Pazuki Kos, the natural man, P S U C H I K O S. Now I'll be glad to sit down with any of you. That's the Greek alphabet. It's not hard, huh? And Omega, two O's. This one's pronounced O. This one's pronounced A. Ah. So you got A B G D, E Z. If you remember easy, you can remember the, once you can get through A, B, G, D, easy, and get this T-H in, you're into our alphabet minus a J and a Q. Can you see that? That's not even hard, is it? Is that hard? You're an educator. Is that hard? <laughs> That's not hard at all. So, 
you got to go to this book. Nobody cares about the truth anymore. The preachers are lying. They've got all this. They're insane. They can't think straight. You tell them the truth. Give them the truth about American history. They say, well, we all have our opinion. That's not an opinion, you knuckleheads. That's the truth about... Why would Jefferson and Washington and why would Alexander Hamilton go out and have a duel with Aaron Burr and get killed if he was such a good Christian like he said? He was the starting of our banking system and he, him, and Alex, him and Aaron Burr get at each other's throat and they go out and have a duel. You don't even go to a duel if you're a Christian, do you? But he called himself that. Boy, aren't we a mess. We can't think right. Not in America. You start telling people the truth and they get bent. How's that for an idiom? Huh? We use idioms all the time, don't we? They get bent over truth. Now, why did I go to this thing of distribute fortunes? Remember there in Luke 8? The Bible says that this man of the gatherings, you've got to look at Mark 5 because you know he's crazy when you look at Mark 5. When you look at Matthew 8... This is the same man. Look at all the verses because you see he's a crazy man in Mark 5. And then in these different chapters it will say he was possessed with devils. That's what it says. He was nuts. He's crazy. If Jesus said, Te soi estino noma, what is this that represents authority in your life? That's what he said. He didn't say... What is your name? Why? We talked about how the translators, half of them were Roman Catholics and half of them were Protestants. They had a knockdown drag out in the translating room for about six years to get the, new, the, the King James Bible translated. There was a lot of compromise, a lot of twisting the words. It's like baptized does not mean to dip in water and it does not mean... To sprinkle water. Whether you like it or not, it don't mean that. Look up baptized in the McClinic and Strong. Are these great books? They're some of the best books I've ever seen. Get Girdlestone's Greek book. He'll tell you baptized. They, hadn't, they couldn't translate it. They didn't know what to do with it. The translators didn't. Because it comes from bapto or baptizo and bapto. That's where the word baptized comes from. The translators were wrestling with that word because it meant to cover. And to cover something doesn't mean to dip it. It means to pour a fluid upon it. The action comes from the person that's pouring the fluid. And the second word, baptism, means to stain or to die. And they're wrestling with that. What do we do with this? That's what Mr. Girdlestone tells us. Brilliant scholar from a couple of hundred years ago. Said they didn't know what to do. So they simply angus took both these words and anglicized them. To anglicize means to turn them into an English word. But the word baptizo originally was an infinitive. Now, you probably don't know what that is. I know what it is. It'll tell you in McClinic and Strong when you look up baptized that it was a verbal noun. It is a noun with verbal character. Now, in the English, it's different. It could be a verb. But in the Greek, it's only a verbal noun. I had an English teacher come here one time. She said, well, that can be also a verb in the English, not in the Greek. It's a verbal noun. That means it is a noun being a person, place, or thing that has a verbal action taken upon it. It actually means to cover with a stain or die, and he's washed us from our sins in his own blood. A blood baptism was a death. I've never heard anybody talk about a blood baptism. But when, Peter, when James and John asked Jesus, grant that one of us will sit on your right hand and the other on the left when you get into heaven, 
He said, you don't know what you're asking. Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? He's not saying, are you able to be dipped in water? He said, can you die the death? They said, we can. He said, both of you will die the martyr's death. Both of you will be baptized with this baptism. So they just turned it into baptize. And they call it water. I would love to talk to a church across and say, do you believe you have to be baptized to be saved? They say, yes, I do. I say, well, me too. Except not in water like you. I have to be baptized in the blood of Christ. Was it Jesus washed in water? Yes, he was. What was that about? It was a proselyte <coughs> baptism. Gosh, I'd have to go on the halakha to talk about that, wouldn't I? Halakha was a twisting of the Word of God by the Babylonian rabbis when they were carried off into captivity into Babylon. And they said, we're not in Jerusalem anymore. And they were unrepentant rabbis. They hadn't repented of all their sun and tree worship over here in Israel for 500 years. But they're over here in Babylon and said, we need a word of God. So instead of calling themselves Levi, sons of Levi, or priests of God, they said, we will call ourselves rabbis, or masters of the word of God, or teachers. And the pl plural would be R-A-B-B-I-N. I-N on the end of a Hebrew word is plural. These were the rabbin or the rabbis of Babylon. And when they were over here, they said, we have to have, we've got to have somebody interpret this targum. That, the targum was called the interpretation. I love teaching on this. This shows you how twisted America is, how twisted the preachers are. They are perverted. Preachers of America, are, that's why I run away from my gospel music heritage and went off into the pop music world. I was so mad at the preachers I could bite nails in two. I was mad at the preachers in my late 20s. I could tell they weren't telling the truth. They're not telling the truth about predestination, about death to self, daily cross, self-denial. I actually heard Billy Graham on the TV yesterday say, you have to be hated by the world. He didn't say how or why. He said, you've got to be hated by the world, and that's all he said. That's for telling the truth, Billy, and you didn't. They didn't hate him. Huh? They didn't hate him. They didn't, that's right. <laughs> they didn't hate him. The world loved Billy Graham. And little 18-year-olds little are sitting there going, yes, I guess I have to go out and tell people that predestination is true and God doesn't love everybody, right? No, the, they don't know the truth. He didn't tell you why you had to be hated. God, the world's got to hate you. And everybody's going, yes. For being a Christian, being a Baptist Christian and getting walking down the aisle and accepting Christ, which is not true, and praying the sinner's prayer, which is not true. I'm thinking, what do they think he meant when he read that verse? He accidentally ran into it. Well, they said you had to... Uh, they came up with a verbal law in Babylon, and they called that halakha, H-A-L-A-K-A-H. And that meant a verbal law, and it couldn't be written down. And they had a head rabbi, and every time a new rabbi would come in, he would put his spin on the, 13, on the 613 laws that were translated out of, the, out of the book of the law, which was called the Torah, which was the first five books of the Bible. We call it the Pentateuch, Pent meaning five. That's the first five books of the Bible. There were 613 laws that they translated over, and they twisted the meanings of everything. That's what the preachers are doing in America. They have a halakha. They say the way of salvation is prayer, sinners prayer. And the Bible says sinners can't pray. If you're an unbeliever, how are you going to call on a God you don't believe in? Yeah, but the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Gosh, I got a letter from a guy. An idiot. <laughs> Talking about me, this guy Howard Carter says, This guy is an American, is an Armenian works believer. He doesn't believe in grace of God as talked about by Paul the Apostle. What does cussing, drinking, smoking have to do with anything? 
I forgot that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, cussing, drinking, smoking, and running around with women, or something like that. And he's just sitting here saying, you don't have to obey God. Yes, you do. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. Right? He that doeth righteousness. If you are a believer, God has to change you. You've got to change. You've got to be willing to put down your old ways and embrace the truth of God. Death to self. Daily cross. People don't understand. If you don't have a daily cross, you cannot be a follower of Christ. He that beareth not his cross and followeth after me cannot be my disciple. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Luke 14, 27. He said in verse 33 there, Luke 14, He that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. You can't be a... What does that mean to forsake all that you have? It means when you have possessions, you've got to dismiss them from your mind so that if you lose them, you say, that's what God wants. Now let me pick up my things and go forward, straight ahead. And whatever it causes you to lose them, that's okay. If you're supposed to, if you lose, you're supposed to lose because he works all things after the counsel of his own will, doesn't he? Even your life and your losing, your pain, he works. He said, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. To be sane means to have a normal, healthy, and sound rational judgments not diseased or unhealthy it means to be reasonable the ability to think with a sound mind america doesn't think not about our history not about nothing i was going to read i am sick the reason i ran off away from god into the music world and into the real estate world I was very successful in real estate very good salesman. Made some real good money. Some people don't know that I put some money back and they accused me from stealing from the ministry. I went for 19 years without drawing a salary out of this ministry. 19 years. All the ministry did was buy my groceries, paid the light bill I had, and that was it. I, the preachers in America, the politicians, do I think Bill, do I think, start to say Bill Clinton, do I think that he thinks rational? No, he's an ignoramus. And our president is an ignoramus. But so was all of his opponents, ignoramuses. I don't believe in any president. I'll tell you what you do. Get this presidential ambition and read about the presidents. <laughs> it's astounding how crooked most of them were. That's just, if you get in power as a, of a nation that's as big as America, what do you do if you have no conviction from God and no new birth? You cheat and you lie and you steal in some honorable way. Do it and twist it and make it look good. Every time I see Donald Trump or it don't matter his nemesis, Hillary Clinton or anybody on there, they're all a bunch of jokers. No, none, none of them are talking about daily cross, death to self, self-denial, looking out for others and not for self. Are they? Let me just read this to you. Read a little out of this uh, Legends, Lies, and Myths. This is a, one of the most respectable historians. He used to go on Larry King. Larry King Live. He used to go on there, and I'd seen him once in a while. And uh, Larry King would say, Mr. Shankman, you are the presidential historian. Let me ask you a question. And Larry King never read any books of the men that he was interviewing because he said he wanted spontaneity. He wanted a spontaneous answer. And if he'd have known, he'd believe what he believed. He'd ask him questions and he'd just blurt things out. But let me read this here. More troubling may be, may be the well-nigh universal attitude among founders toward democracy. Historian Charles Beard writes that most of the drafters of the Constitution viewed democracy as something to be rather to be dreaded than encouraged. Well into the 19th century, he insists, the word democracy was repeatedly used by conservatives to smear the opponents of all kinds. It was a bad word until early 1900s. They did not believe in capitalism, the founders didn't. 
Capitalism means to distribute the fortunes to the individual, and boy, when you start doing that, people start getting crooked, don't they? Even so, a stout defender of people's rights as Jefferson never publicly identified himself as a Democrat. Throughout his long life, he preferred to call himself a Republican, and he used that term. I'm not telling you to call yourself a Republican, okay? And that term, even after many of his own supporters had begun to call themselves Democrats, so controversial was the word Democrat that it does not appear in any of the famous documents associated with the birth of the nation, not in the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, or any of the state constitutions. Another myth about the founders is that they have always been revered. In truth, some of those now considered most important have only recently been elevated to the National Hall of Fame. Sixty years ago, Jefferson was still regarded with suspicion and with indifference by Americans. Just 60 years before he printed this book, which was in the 90s. Uh, Cooper, another historian, reported that the textbooks passed over Jefferson by mere mention of his presidency and his signing the Declaration. Even second-hand book shops were surprised when anybody inquired for a book of Jefferson. The guy was... He didn't just have an affair with Sally Hemings. He had affairs with lots of women over in France. The founders believed in equality is no more true than believed in... Let me read this to you. The fact that they said they believed in equality is no more true than they believed in democracy. The, the Declaration of Independence say it, but the founders didn't believe all men are created equal. They, be, they apparently believed all men are created equal in the eyes of the law, and that was all. They did not believe men are socially or economically equal and didn't believe they should be. You couldn't vote unless you had a lot of money in early America. As colonial historian Jack Green puts it, no idea was further from their minds. When they talked about equality in social economic sense, they meant no more than, than each man should have equal right to achieve the best material life he could within the limits imposed upon him. If you're black, you can go operate in the black community. You can get all you can get out of that community. Don't move over to the white community. That's what he believed. Put another way, the all-American the all-American founders didn't believe in the all-American concept that any all-American boy could grow up to be president. He said that was a lie. We don't know we don't know our own history, do we? I'm talking about Washington being a great, an American hero. Jefferson and Franklin said he believed in the divinity of Christ. Uh, it is also reported that he thought there was other gods as well. Here's the whole point. We want to distribute fortunes, don't we? We have to obey God. We can obey our own desires. When that man in Luke the 8th chapter, he was said to be possessed with the demon. Demonizomai means possessed with demon. means to be insane. He was said to be possessed with a demon. Then after Christ had his, con his confrontation with him, the Bible says the people came from out, out of town, came and found him sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Right mind is the word sophroneo, S-O-P-H-R-O-N-E-O. Sophroneo means sane mind. He was insane. Christ cast out self. That's all demons are, self. Jesus said so in Mark, the first chapter. He comes across this man. The man says, what have we to do with thee? The man says, we, plural, and they believed the demons were all feminine in the first century. What have we, us feminine demons, have to do with you? And the Bible says, and Jesus rebuked him, A-U-T-O, self, singular, masculine gender. He rebuked the man. He didn't rebuke them, feminine demons. They're crazy when they say they have a demon. And America believes this in the Pentecostal churches. It's crept over to the Baptist churches. No, the most evil thing in the world is a man's heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know a man's heart? The most evil thing in you is you. The most evil thing in me has been me. 
boy, I had, God had to put me in the hospital, nearly kill me before I said, Lord, from now on, I'm going to tell everybody all the truth all the time. I started studying the Greek about 40 years ago. I hadn't been studying it all my life. Started about 40 years ago, day and night. I found out America doesn't know nothing. The preachers are stupid. They don't even know the way of salvation. The Baptists will get up and say, walk down the aisle and accept Christ as your personal Savior. And the, they'll say, pray this sinner's prayer. Ask God into your heart. You can't ask Him in your heart. Your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. He's got to give a new heart to His predestinated elect family. And when He gives you that new heart, He'll start working on you and you'll start wanting to obey Him. And you'll start wanting to know something about the Bible. This guy says, cussing or smoking or drinking don't have anything to do with getting saved. It's just belief. You can't just... Some have coined the phrase easy believe as a pretty good phrase. There's no easy believing in Christ. Believe is a verb. Believe is something you do. Let me just give you two verses that I have quoted already this morning. Look over here in 1 John. 1 John, the third chapter. 1 John, the third chapter. I sense tomorrow was... Memorial Day, nothing in America is the way we've been sold this bill of goods. Nothing. America was founded on racism. The American Indian was said they didn't have any souls. The black man, when he was in, in slavery, was said he didn't have a soul. And when the amazing thing, when, when James Knox Polk, when he uh, annexed New Mexico, Texas, parts of of Arizona back in the mid early 2000s I was watching the news and I followed it a few days there were some Mexicans came across the border in Arizona and said this land by land grant in the 1800s belonged to our great 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 grandfathers and they had some record on them and we demand some sort of restitution in this land here. The United States said, get back the border. You get off the, across the border. You don't get nothing. We told them, no. We, America has stolen all this land that we live on. Did you know that? It's, America is built on racism. Started with the Indians, went to the blacks, went to the Mexicans, and the Chinese people. Like these people are less human than uh, you can't be saved, you can't know Christ because you're a heathen. Don't believe any of that stuff. Look here. Where did I say was going into? First John. First John 3, verse 7. Little children, he always referred to, John would always refer to the church as children because they weren't grown, they weren't mature. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. You can't just come up and say, what's wrong with smoking and drinking and cussing? Everything. Everything. He that doeth, dikaiosune. This is the word righteous, D-I-K-A-I-O-S. U-N-E. Dikayao sine means equitable or equal. We get our word equal from equitable. If something is equitable, there's no imbalance like on a seesaw. If you're taking algebra, you've got to make the, the equation balance. This equals to this. The Old Testament Israel equals the church. We're circumcised of the heart. Our hearts are sprinkled. The Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled over here. The law is written in fleshy tables of our hearts. The law is written on tables of stone over here. If you want to learn the Bible, learn the Old Testament, and it will have to equal the new. It's all a balance. 
Now, he that doeth, I like the word righteous, D-I-K is the stem of the word. The stem gives you the basic word. D-I-K comes from D-I-K-E, and that is the word right. He that doeth right is right. Now, do you have to be told what right and wrong is? It's written in your heart. Sometimes when you say, should I do this? Well, you're asking yourself if it's right or wrong, and would you be questioning yourself if it was, if it was okay? Huh? Usually you're not going to question yourself if it's okay. And look over here. John is the guy that's saying this. Look over here in... In John 3, John 3, John 3, I love this chapter, it's got so many good things in it. Jesus had told Nicodemus, you must be born again. If you're born again, you're born by God from above. Again, is the word anothen, A-N-O-T-H-E-N. It means from above. If your birth comes from above, it comes from God. It doesn't come from your free will or a walk down the aisle, does it? I don't believe in invitation hymns. God's not inviting anyone to follow Him. No one. He's commanding everyone that belongs to Him, follow me. Follow me, Akulatheo, A-K-O-U, L-A-T-H-E-O. Akulatheo is the word follow. Follow is an imperative command. If Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, and He said He was, He said before Abraham was, I am the God of the Old Testament. The I am God of the Old Testament was Jehovah. He said, that's me. The Pharisees said, we'll kill you for calling yourself God. That's in John the 8th chapter. Akulatheo means to be in the same way with. We've been talking about the way. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The, te, means there's only one there's no many ways to heaven. Now, Oprah Winfrey says there's any number of ways. You can be a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Baptist or a Catholic. or You can get to heaven any way you want to. That's what Billy Graham said. He said there was all these different ways to heaven. No, Jesus said, I am the only way. It is a narrow way. It's full of tribulation and trials. And we have to go... Th I've been talking about this. I got off on... America being insane because tomorrow is Memorial Day. Do I believe in Memorial Day? No. Am I patriotic? No, I'm not. Very simple. Patriotic. Comes from the word pater in the Greek. And what does pater mean? Father. And who is our Father? God. Oops, wrong G. Our Father is God, isn't it? Our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Well, we don't believe that. H-A-G-I-A-Z-O. Hallowed comes from the word hagios, which is the word holy. Holy means single or pure. And the only way you become single or pure is you have to go through fire to try you. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. The trying of your faith is more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire. We have to go through the fire, through troubles, through trials, through tribulation. When we go through tribulation, people mistake tribulation for being behind on their car payment or being or getting sick, that's not tribulation. Tribulation is people pursuing you and want to destroy you because of your belief in truth. 
You start telling people that Christmas is Christ's Mass, it's Roman Catholicism, they're not going to like that, are they? You tell them that God doesn't love everybody, they ain't going to like that, they'll hate you for that. You tell them Easter is Ishtar and it's paganism, it's the resurrection of Tammuz. Be sure and tell them that Jesus was God in the flesh. He died to save sinners. He's born in Bethlehem in a manger. But Easter has not, nothing to do with him, neither is Christmas. Easter, Christmas, Valentine's, Mardi Gras, Halloween are all the same festival among ancient world in different cultures. Same thing. And whether people like it or not, that's the truth. Deal with it. So if we say, Hallowed be thy name, name is the word onoma, what we're saying, it means authority. Hallowed be thy authority, which is your word or your law. Lord, help me get rid of all of this insanity in my life, not learning the truth about the Bible. Or even America. If God is our father, who is our mother? Huh? It's Jerusalem, isn't it? And who is Jerusalem? What is heavenly Jerusalem? Huh? It's the church. Actually, we are come to Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, the church of the firstborn. That's heavenly Jerusalem. And the Bible says in Galatians, the fourth chapter, that Jerusalem is our mother. I'm not patriotic against a nation that's corrupt. You think God's going to let you have a Christmas tree when you get into heaven? Don't think so. You think he's going to let us sing, Oh, beautiful for praise the skies. You think he's going to let you sing America the Beautiful in heaven? While people that were believers from Afghanistan are going, What about us? <laughs> and they're believers, and they're going to be there. Or the believers from Russia are going to say, We want to sing the Russian, and we'll be up here to fight. Okay, let's get those guys. Patriotism has nothing to do with the Bible. I abide by the laws of America. If the light turns red, I stop. If it says 45 miles an hour, I usually drive 40. If it says 70. <laughs> She'll tell you, I do not need hardly go the speed limit. If it says 65, I'm going 55. She said, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Hurry. That's her blood pressure coming on. Uh, <laughs> she says, pucka, pucka, pucka. That's, she got that off of Andy Griffith's show where goobers say, keep saying pucka, pucka, pucka. <laughs> this, is, this is what I believe in. I believe in the church. Paul said in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians, the last verse, he says, what have I to do to judge those who are outside the church? I'm a member, and we're supposed to be honest, honorable, telling truth, abiding by the laws of the land that we live in. Don't rob banks. Don't speed. Don't do these things. Don't get mad in traffic. When you get mad in traffic, you get mad at some guy cut you off on the inter interstate, and you're going to get him back so you pull up behind him like I used to do and get right on his tail. I'll show you. That's a real good way to do it, isn't it? That's what I used to do. I was stupid. If you ever get Nashville traffic straightened out, they absolutely need you in Chicago. And after you get that straightened out, we need to ship you out to L.A. Boy, that's a madhouse on the freeways over there. It's like being in hell and back or something. <laughs> You can't straighten out traffic. Don't get mad at it. What do you do, Jim? I pull over and let them go on by. Some guy's riding my bumper. I just pull over. Say, go to it. Watch that guy go. I'll sit there and applaud him or something, you know. Give place to or gay. <laughs> that just hit me. Over there in Revelation, uh, Romans 12. 
Romans 12. We've been talking about the orge. I'm going to come back to it next week. How much time do I have, Mike? I didn't know I'd spend this much time on America. I'd like to read so many things in these books I'd like to read to you. America's crazy. They don't know. It doesn't take a lot to know the truth. You just get real reasonable and real rational and say, that's wrong. It don't matter how many people are voting that you don't know what you're talking about. Do what's right. That's righteous. Do right. And he says over here, well, he, I didn't even read it, but John said the same thing over here in, uh, in John 3. He said, He that doeth truth cometh to the light. Didn't John say that? Actually, it was Jesus saying it. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. Truth, aletheia, means to pull the cover off. Expose everything the way it is. That's what I'm doing up here in this pulpit. I'm trying to tell you how America is. And we're so stupid in America. You can tell somebody the truth and make them look it right in the eye. Well, that's your opinion. No, you're an idiot. You're stupid, and I don't want to talk to anybody like you anymore. Goodbye. I've actually told people that. Say you're ignorant. I had a teacher one day, and I said, God doesn't love everybody. And then I went back the next week at the vet. Now they said, didn't you have a t-shirt on last week that said something about God not loving everybody? I said, yes, ma'am. He does not love everybody. He loved Jacob and hated Esau before they were born. She went, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear that. La, 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 don't tell me about that. That's what she did. I thought, what an imbecile. And I told her, you are ignorant, woman. She said, don't call me ignorant. I said, ignorant means unlearned. That's what it means. You mean I can't tell you what you really are? Didn't want to face the truth about nothing. You know that's all that's wrong with America. They do not want to face the truth. They've got all this error. Well, I was going to go somewhere over there. and, Huh? Romans 12. What do we do when people are involved in their orge? Well, this will tell you right here. The orge... Orge is the very nature of man according to Ephesians, the second chapter. It's man's nature. And over here, I'll tell you what to do with it. The 12th chapter of Romans. Orge. Boy, I have been involved in this in my life, and if you haven't, you're lying. Orge. That's an R. This is an O. R. G. A. O. R, G, E. When something ends in a Ada, it's feminine gender. Even if it's Ada nu, Ada n, it's feminine gender. Orge is feminine. It is the wrath of anger over covetousness, anger of man being covetous, Remember, covetousness is idolatry. Covetous, P-L-E-O-N-E-K-T-E-S. That's idolatry. It means to want more any way you can get it, any diabolical scheming way. If you can want more, you're covetous, and that is idolatry, E-I-D-O-L-O-L-A-T-R-E-I-A. Idolatry comes from ido and latruo. It means to serve what you see. And that's the first thing you see in the morning. You go to the mirror and start shaving that idol or combing that idol's hair. When we serve what we see, we see self. When you serve what you see, that's what covetousness is. And when you're involved in orge, that's being angry for your own self and your own things, and you have to learn to crucify self. If somebody's running you off the road, what do you do? Pull up behind them, scream at them, pull a gun on them, cuss them? Let them do it. That's what this 12th chapter of Romans says. Look here. 
that de- I've said this before. Orge is our biggest problem. It's rage and anger at the world because we can't have our way. That's what it's about. Look here in, Rev- in Romans, the 12th chapter. I can't read all this chapter. He tells you how you're supposed to be. Uh, look at verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. That word love is agape. Agape is one of the words for love. It was a relationship that fathers had for their sons, that kings had for their subjects. They gave them laws and they willingly walked in those laws. This is love, this is agape, that we walk after His commandments. But you can't walk after His commandments if you are dissimulating. D-E-E-S-S, I can't even remember how you spell dissimulation. D-I-S-S-E-M-U-L-A-T-I-O-N. D-I-S-S-I-M. D-I-S-S-I-M-U-L-A-T-I-O-N. Now, I know the Greek word. I don't forget that. Anupokrites. Thank you. A-N-U-P-O-K-R-I-T-E-S. Anupokrites comes to the word Hippocrates, H-U-P-O-K-R-I-T-E-S. A hypocrite was an actor in the first century. He was assuming a character on a stage. He was an actor. When you place the alpha privative, first letter of the Greek alphabet in front of a word, it negates the word and gives an opposite meaning. It means no hypocrite, no acting. You cannot pretend to be walking in the commandments of God. That's not possible. It's not possible. If you're walking God's commandments, you're not going to be a hypocrite about it because God says you're not walking in my commandments. I told you not to do that. When you're getting angry at somebody cutting you off, getting mad at a person for cheating you, you can't even do that. What are we predestined to? Whom he did foreknow. Whom? Who's? He did foreknow. He also did predestinate. Pro. Whom he did foreknow? Prognosco. P r o g i n o s k o. Whom he did beforehand know intimately, and he knew us before the foundation of the world. Those of us are believers. He also did predestinate. Prohorizo. Predetermined for the light, for the horizon. Horizon is our word horizon. He's predetermined all those that he knew. He's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame. If we're without blame, we're not going to be angry at traffic. Well, Jim, I haven't gotten over that yet. Well, you will if God deals with you enough. He dealt with me. I was driving 120 miles an hour in a sports car about... 33 years old, headed towards Memphis. And I looked out there, and I, I had, had a 390 engine in this thing, and boy, it would fly. And I would do that every time I got on the highway. And I got to thinking on my way to Memphis one day, if I hit a stick out there, I'm going to be in that field, I'm going to be dead. And I stopped driving fast right then. Right that point, I went, I'll be dead. I was being foolish. God doesn't want us to live that way. He wants us to live believing Him about everything that comes in our life. And He'll teach you something. You have to put you out on a highway somewhere or stick you in a hospital and say, Now what can you do, Jim Brown? i got these IVs in both arms and I can't do nothing. Well, I got you here. Now, surrender. Give up. And I did. So let's keep reading here. Let, be, let walking in the commandments of God be without hypocrisy. You can't do that. Abhor that which is evil. Declare that which is good. Good. 
Be kindly affectioned. Philostergos means to have affection for your brothers that are walking right. With brotherly love, Philosadelphos. In honor, Time. T-I-M-E looks like time. But it means placing a value upon. If you honor your mother and father, you'll honor God and your mother of Jerusalem, the church. And your days will be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Our mother was also the tree of life, wasn't it? We learned that here a few weeks ago. Our mother was a tree of life. You'll find that in Proverbs 3. Because the tree of life gives us length of days and long life. The same thing that our mother gives us there in in the ninth chapter in the twentieth chapter of Exodus with the Ten Commandments, and she's a tree of life in the third chapter of Proverbs, and the Proverbs the fifteenth chapter, fifteenth chapter, and the Bible says that in the fifteenth chapter of Proverbs that the tongue that speaks right is a tree of life to us. It speaks sound doctrine. These preachers are not preaching any sound doctrine. I've said so many things this morning that most people, before you come here, you never heard of, have you? And how do I know that? Because I made it up? No, because I read my brains out. I read constantly. Study. I've got super library in my home. got thousands of books. You know, sometimes I walk in my library and I look at it like I'm in a candy store and I'm only about six years old. I wonder if I've read out of this yet. And I get over on, I got a table upstairs in my library. Got two rooms full of books from floor to ceiling. And I feel like, boy, I'm rich with knowledge if I can just get all this stuff down. You know, all it takes to learn, study, 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 study. You say, well, that's hard, but you know what you get out of it? Wealth, riches. I'm not talking about money. You get a wealth of knowledge so that when you walk out in public, people say something, you say, well, that ain't true. If you want to know, I'll tell you. If you don't want to know, I won't tell you, okay? I'd say that to a lot of people. If you want to know the truth about predestination, I'll tell you. I told somebody that the other day. I want to hear about that. I say, okay, bye. It's that simple. Do you know the elect, God's predestinated elect family want to know the truth somewhere in their life? They may turn you down that day, but they may be seeking it out somewhere down the road. I love information. It keeps me from being fooled. Do you like being fooled? Then educate yourself. All right? I tell every young person, there's nothing you can do like reading books. Nothing. Nothing. You'll get rich and wealthy one day and you won't care if you have big fancy cars because nobody's going to like you for that, will they? Tell them Christmas is pagan, they'll get mad at you for the rest of their life. You can dress the way you want to and wear all the diamond rings you want. They'll never walk up to you and say, I really like your ring. Never will. Huh? <laughs> but let's read on here. Because I was going to show you what you do when people get mad. I'm going to preach on the... I've been wanting to preach on... Back, go back to the orge for a long time. The orge is our biggest problem. That's our anger and rage because somebody's beating us. They're getting a promotion when we think we should have got it. They're outrunning us. They're outdoing us. They're getting the championship. They're getting the medals. What about me? When's my turn coming? You ever known anybody like that? You? <laughs> Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints. We send money to needy people every month, every first of the month. Given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you. Now bless. Now who gets to define the word bless? Do you get to define it? Well, I think it means to give them ice cream and cake and go help them mow their grass. That's not what it means. Eulogeo. It comes from you and Lagos. Do you get to, what are the well words you give them? Huh? 
Bless them is to give them the word of God. Give them what God said, isn't it? If you bless them, you're going to give them the truth. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Don't cut off fellowship with them unless they're believers not walking in truth. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. That word rejoice is the same word as joy. But the Bible says Paul told the Philippians in the first fourth chapter, starting in verse 1, he told the Philippians, you are my joy, but you can't be joyous. Same word in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Rejoice not with iniquity. In other words, people who are anomia, that's the word iniquity, anomia, it comes from nomos, which is the word law. The law, all law is fulfilled by agape, and the alpha primitive, no law in their life. Don't rejoice with people who don't have God's law governing their life. Don't go to eat with them. Don't go to their house to celebrate Memorial Day or don't go over to a, have a steak with them on Friday night and they don't believe God. If they're free will people and they don't believe in predestination, leave them alone. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another, if they're not minding the things of Christ, and they, don't, and they hate predestination, and they hate the fact that you're going to tell them it was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago, get away from them. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Condescend men doesn't mean to talk down to them. It means to bring yourself down to their level. If they're so poor, you think, well, they're not worthy of me talking to them. We have people that come here that are on the low rung of the ladder of money and I always go around and pat them on the back and say how you doing they don't want a lot of attention that they don't have much but I always go around and say hey to them be not wise in your own conceits recompense to no man evil for evil provide things that are honest in the sight of all men if it be possible, as much life in you live peaceably with all men in the church, not outside the church. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Don't you take revenge. That's the action that most men want to do when it comes to the orge. Wherever I put that, the orge. Here it is. Anger, wrath of covetousness. I'll get you back. Look what he says to do. But rather give place, topos, T-O-P-O-S, give a spot. If somebody insists on being involved in the orge, let them. That's what it says. Give place to or gay for it is written vengeance belongs to me God says you don't need to be taking it on your enemy at work because they're nasty to you we're not supposed to be doing that but we have a lot of that don't we they got a promotion that I think belonged to me huh. no it didn't if you're not looked upon as second place you're not living the righteous life People can't put you first. Jesus said, those that are last will be first. So give place to orge, for it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. I will feed anybody that's hungry, if I know they're hungry. I tell the story, me and Mary, we were out at 100 Oaks and we pulled up right by that that hamburger place, Wendy's or something out there, and there was a guy that had a sign that said, I'm hungry. It didn't say, I'm traveling, I need a job or this. It just said, I'm hungry. I said, boy, that says it. I got to stop. So I stopped and pulled over. 
I said, let's go inside this burger joint. I said, let's get you a big burger. He said, okay, and I'll get you a big drink. I said, how about an apple pie? I could afford that easier than he could afford to stand there and keep begging. And just before I left, I gave him a cassette. I said, just watch that when you get a chance, okay? Or listen to this when you get a chance. He said, okay, I will. You got to care about whether people are hungry or not. Now, if you are going to continue to rebel against God, I'll get to the place I won't have anything to do with you. I'll pull away from you. But if I can help the downtrodden, the needy, and the poor, it, when the Bible says this, it don't mean if they're doing right to feed them. If they're your enemy, they're not doing right, are they? They're doing some things wrong in your life. There's people that have left here. If they call me and said, Jim, I need some money. They left under real bad circumstances. I couldn't turn them down. And I mean that. I can't let people go, especially if they're a believer and they're in trouble. And then he says, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine any hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him to drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with your good. That's a hard thing to get a hold of. How many people are going to be involved in the orge? Everybody, according to Ephesians. Look at Ephesians, the second chapter. You may not be willing to admit you've been involved in the oil gay, but the Bible says it's your nature. And it's my nature. Here in, am I out of time, Mike? All right. Look at verse 3 of Ephesians 2. Among whom also, he's talking about those of us he's quickened and made alive. We were dead in trespasses and sin. Among whom, among whom also we had our conversation in times past. Conversation doesn't mean just your talk. It's the word anastrepo. A-N-A-S-T-R-E-P-H-O. It means your method of living. You had your method of living in times past. And look at your method of living and what it was. In the lust of the flesh, epithumia, longing for that which is forbidden, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, whereby nature, you were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That word wrath is the word or gay. All people are children of the orge. That's your nature and mine. Believe me, I had to overcome it. I didn't overcome it. God overcame it in me. Nobody's been more angry at the world than I've been. Boy, I used to get into a rage in my early 30s. I'd just get crazy at the world. You can't do that. But it's your nature. How are you going to get over it? God's going to put you through fire and trials and persecution. One day, Along the way, you're going to say, I've got to stop doing this. I've got to stop saying this. I've got to stop getting angry in the car. I've got to stop this. If you stop the orge, your marriage will get better. Your life will get better. Orge, is our dis orge will kill us. That's the rage and the fury of man. That's our nature. Huh? And you'll drive slower. And you'll drive slower. <laughs> well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth. Lord, I hope the church is getting this message that there's an exact defined truth and men don't want it in the world. The preachers don't want it. The politicians, the teachers, we're in the apostasy. Lord, it's here full force, full blown. Thank you for your truth. It causes us to continue in your word and we'll give you praise for everything. Fight our battles. Lead us to your elect. In Christ's name, amen.
weeks ago. She told me to tell you that she's been meaning to get in touch or send you a card, but she didn't want to bombard you because she felt like you were probably being bombarded by a lot of people about your health. Well, but she just wanted to let you know she's thinking of you. I know and she is. And into love and gratitude and everything. Well, tell her we love her when you see her, okay? I will. And she's going to make the picnic, I think she says. I hope she and, can. And you mentioned the first shall be last, the last shall be I think about that a lot. That's in the can 20th you, chapter of 20th chapter of Matthew. That. I know you can't give me a lot. No well, that's about the Jews having been called first by God. And it'll tell you about how this man went out and he called men to do the work in his field. And he called these first and gave them the full pay, gave them a penny a day. And he went during the middle of the day and he hired some for a penny a day. And then the crop was about in. He goes to these last and is talking about the Gentiles, us, being called last. And the Jews can't say, we heard the message first, it belongs to us. That's why he said, many are called, but few are chosen. Right after that, he says that the word call, word chosen is the word eklaktos, elect. Okay. So we're the last. Think applying to us, like the, the black folks. Yeah. Is there any extra, any measure of special grace for, the, for the, how black folk have fared in the world? Nothing other than the grace of God. Just the, no, same I don't. It, it's the same. Men, you're the same. Yeah. We're not different races in God's eyes. I, mean, just the stuff I, I know this thing with the black race has been, has been terrible. Yeah. I know that. It's just the idiocy. It's like I said. It's because most people in America are white and unsaved and unbelievers. Just recently, I saw some things I did, had, had never seen before in what was what was done to some yeah. It's, I mean, I have investigated all of I can, and it's crazy. I've got a book, book called Black Like Me, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, Scott found them on the Internet. I'll bring a copy of it to you. Okay. And it's about this white man that got his, he had his skin, he injected himself, made him dark, mm -hmm. and kinked his hair. He went down south in the late 50s like to, present to, present him, to present himself as a black man. He said, I have never been under such persecution in my life he said that's most outrageous the black man has been that. has been i'll i'll bring a copy of it to you All right. i love you. you love you too thank you i'm so glad you're better are you going to be here tonight i will be okay all right y'all want some gum you want some that's for me i love you god is good to the to the what Huh? Moon. Moon. Whatever. <laughs> Let me get y'all some gum. Hold on a second. I, I want you want watermelon? Okay, I'll give you watermelon. Huh? You want what? You want the yellow? Okay, I'm going to give her this watermelon. There's your watermelon. And then, all right, and here's the yellow. You like the yellow? There you go. Well, they are really good. If you if you sit down and you start, they're real hard to put down because they got your attention. You're going, my gosh, I can't believe all this stuff. Do you? That's good. That's great. Well, people need to know the truth. They do. Every time I run across a historian, they know the truth about it, but most of them don't want to talk about it. Well, we all have our own belief about blah, 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 blah. Look, you know the truth. Why won't you face it? For the same reason everybody else won't face the truth. There's a disease called opinionitis. Well, they don't want people to dislike them. That's what it is. Don't want to be disliked and be unpopular. I want to be popular in the world. The word gets around the neighborhood if you get somebody upset. Well, I got 11-year-olds that can quote it. That's good. That's good. You need to get that book, Doctrine of Discovery. 
That is unbelievable about the American Indian. Oh, yeah. Oh, the Trail of Tears. I read that. It's just, it's pathetic. I, I grew up on the uh, uh, Iroquois Nation. I'm from out in South Onondaga, Onondaga Tribe. Where? Iroquois Nation. Where? That's where I was brought up. South, where? South Onondaga, the Onondaga Tribe. That's part of the Iroquois Nation. Where? Central New York. Just okay. south of Syracuse, I'm sorry. Well, the American Indian has been done as wrong as anybody's ever been done. Well, you ought to hear my friends who are Indian. They're not happy campers, still. Yeah. Hey, what are you doing? Well, there's the truth if we want to think. I'm doing a lot better. Yeah. We, if, we would, if we would face the truth, America won't deal with it. They won't deal with the truth about anything about themselves, about America, nothing. They actually believe these guys. They actually believe those guys that call themselves politicians. I knew a bunch of them in Hendersonville. I don't trust any of them. Well, it's just because they think those people are successful and they want to rub elbows. They want to rub elbows and they want a piece of their action. That's all it's about. When I was in music, I wanted to rub elbows with people who were important so maybe I could get a contract or something. And I did some compromising, not enough, because they ended up getting angry before it was over with. Well, I, I appreciate it, brother. I sold out. You did. Did you tell Tom to get some more? Do you have one at home? I got two. All right. What are you doing there, guy? What you guys doing besides doodling? <laughs> you get tall? Well, no, I shrunk. Apparently, I've shrunk two inches. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? You doing better? Yeah. Are you? We're yeah. good. Did you? Yeah. Um, uh, How's your dog doing? Oh, she's fabulous. Is she? Where is she? She's with her babysitter. Oh. So she's back in Fort Worth. She is. You don't take her with you places, or? Well, we had planned. Uh, we're buying a home, and we well, we're, uh, we bought a, a mobile home. Yeah. And we were planning on moving in. What are you doing? How you doing? What are you doing, Dan? Good to see you. <laughs> really good to see y'all. Y'all just decided to come up on this week. Well, good. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Good to see y'all. Really is. Let me get my stuff together. Out there right now? Yeah, it's over at four o'clock. It's over at four. Oh, he's at home. I'm about to go get him. Go to him. When you just go out there and look at the exhibits? Yeah, see what kind of junk they got. They got all kinds of stuff out there. Hey, Do you want to go to the let me tell you something real quick, Jim. Yeah. You mentioned about you know the homeless again, right? Okay, mm -hmm. check this out. Just the other day, I'm getting in my car at Rivergate, and a guy comes up to me and said. Uh, can you get me some food? He said, I'm not asking for money. And I said, so I'm getting in my car, getting my wallet, and I'm saying in my mind, oh, I hate this. I don't know if he wants truth or not. So then, he saw my bumper sticker, check out how I love, you saw how I hate it. So he started arguing with me, and he brought it up. He started arguing with me, and saying all this stuff. I said, sir, that's not right. He'd be in contrary, I'm trying to tell you. Not as blind as you right now. He said, "Well, I'm just telling you what I believe. You believe what you believe." So I said, 
you know, all of a sudden, I don't feel like buying you food anymore. I wouldn't either. I wouldn't have bought him nothing. Thank you. So I gave him two dollars. I wouldn't bought him anything. <laughs> I wouldn't give him anything. I started to give a woman two dollars down at the farmer's market, or give her a dollar down at the mar farmer's market one day, because I knew she was just going around begging. And I said, here's a dollar. She said, and I said, watch or listen to this cassette. She said, give me two dollars. And I reached out and grabbed the one she, I gave her. I said, I'm not giving you anything when you're not thankful for what I give you. And I wouldn't give her nothing. I know when people want to fight the truth, don't help them in their rebellion. Leave them alone. I wouldn't give them nothing. When they're going to fight the truth, say, no, nope, decided different. The Bible said, I'm not to communicate to you. We communicate unto him that teaches in all good things, and you have nothing to say. No, don't give people, those people that go around shopping centers, begging around, they do that on a regular basis. They're panhandlers. You find somebody that's really hungry, that's one thing. But you find somebody that's bumming for a living, they won't work. When I see a young guy standing on the side of the road with a sign, I'm hungry or whatever, and he's young and he could be working, I don't help those kind. Yeah. They won't work. They don't like working. 20 year old girls. Hold these for me. I got to put them in the back of my car.